Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, today, we're going to go through some financial literacy for people who are starting their lives in finance. And what we've got is three interns from Decatur Capital are joining us today. And each of them has gone through a training program on financial literacy. And they're going to talk about each different section of it and then give a little bit of how they view it um, so that the students who are on this can understand from other students how they feel and how they've learned um, to try to help them get to where they are. We're eventually going to have a program where we will um, certify people as financially literate. And we'd like you to email foundation at cfaatlanta.org if you want to be a part of that. And we'll send you out a, a, a test and some information. Um, we will hold questions until the end. And um, please use the chat function when you want to make a, give a, uh, have a question. Um, the first section is going to be started with um, Zaire. Zaire Newsom is going to cover Live With Less. Alex Chichillin is going to cover um, Manage Risk. Lynn Sue is going to cover Invest In You. And I'm going to cover Invest For You. And then we're going to do some questions. So we should do about 10 minutes each. And then um, we'll leave plenty of time for question and answers at the end. So ASFIP Foundation was founded a few uh, five years ago to help with financial literacy in the Atlanta community. And we were founded by CFA members of the society here in Atlanta. It's about a 15, 1600 member society that was been around since 1960. The way we think about financial literacy is having four components, investing in yourself through health and wellness, living with less, managing risk, and then investing for yourself. Now I'm going to turn it over to Zaire, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about living with less. Zaire? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zaire Newsom, a student at Clark Atlanta University studying accounting and minoring in computer science. Um, some first things I would like to say about living with less, um, I definitely would say that living with less is ultimately um, giving you more freedom. Uh, being a minimalist does not mean to not spend your money on anything. It doesn't mean not to treat yourself. I think it just means living simply and prioritizing your money. Next slide. Just tell yes. me next. Next slide, please. Um, first aspects of budgeting would be identifying how much money you make, um, how much you want to pay yourself, or as I like to say, how much you want to invest in yourself. Um, and what are your monthly expenses? What bills do you have? Um, how much do you want to spend on treating yourself monthly and things of that nature? Um, the golden rule, always spend less than what you make. And I feel as though spending less than what you make would allow you just to have more free time. Well, not free time, but a uh, free opportunity to spend your money and pay for things that are more important as far as advancing yourself. Um, when you begin the process of budgeting, I would definitely recommend to share with a friend just so you have someone who can hold you accountable to committing to your budget. Um, a good, oh, sorry. Uh, to be good at budgeting, I know writing a budget makes it 60% more successful and better is sharing a budget, which will give you 80% greater chance of succeeding. Um, some guidelines for life. When you look at budgeting, um, I know we have needs, wants, and savings. And this is the 20, the 50, 30, 20 rule. And that rule is important to me because um, I definitely care about early retirement and I think you guys should as well. So preparing for early retirement, I definitely would recommend using this rule. 
um, implementing this budget structure early on will definitely discipline your spending habits. And as you see, your spending habits would be um, housing, insurance, food, your monthly bills, how are you getting to and from work, um, your wants, you know, what are you investing your money in as far as uh, just things that you desire. And savings, um, I would definitely say saving for retirement, paying off debt, uh, furthering your education as far as developing new skills, and of course, preparing for a new car or home fund. Next slide, please. Um, the first aspects of living with less, and I just want to clarify this. Um, th a budget is one thing. It's not broken down how it is in the PowerPoint, so don't get overwhelmed or anything like that. Um, creating a budget, I definitely would recommend that you plan. Um, budgeting, budget spending is basically just organizing how you spend your money. Um, how much money you want to save, what are your needs, and what are your wants. Um, creating your future plan. I definitely would think uh, before you create a future plan, I would ask myself, where do I want to be in the future? Um, a lot of us are college students now. We're either early on in college or graduating and seeking to start our careers. Um, I would definitely create a five to 10 year plan to know where you want to be in the future and start uh, budgeting for your money now, putting money away so that you can reach that plan or reach that goal. Um, as far as creating your spending plan needs, um, I definitely would recommend first to identify the area you live in. Um, being in Atlanta, that is very expensive. Um, so as far as spending your money on food, utilities, transportation, that can be costly. But I know being down south that renting and housing may be fairly cheaper. So it's important that you create a spending plan for your needs. Um, as far as your wants, again, being in Atlanta, entertainment may be more expensive, travel may be more expensive, and uh, cable and your phone bill, that just depends on who your company is. So that's important to create a spending plan as well. Um, when you talk about paying yourself first, um, I would definitely highlight paying yourself first as an investment. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I'm just putting money in my pocket. I would look at your, your paying yourself first as prioritizing, investing in new skills, um, making yourself a definitely more valuable in the market. And this is a very competitive market, so I recommend paying yourself first. Um, even establishing an emergency fund when you pay yourself first. A lot of the times people look at emergency funds as uh, just putting money in a, a bank account, a checkings account. Um, and I would definitely look at emergency funds on a more broad aspect, investing in 401ks, Roth IRA accounts and things of that nature. Um, I know a lot of the times when we are in college, uh, when we're on break and things like that, we like to work a small job. And I definitely would recommend that as well to get yourself prepared to start your emergency fund. Because when I go to work, I see a lot of old people. I know I just worked at um, Whole Foods and I'm seeing people in the meat department that are like, 65, 70 years old. And I think nine times out of 10, that happens because they're not putting money away at a young age or they're just blowing all of their money. Um, as far as spending, um, for me, before I get into this, I would definitely like to highlight that I have a small business. So I have to be very careful with how I spend my business money. I cannot take that money that I earned from my business and just go buy a pair of shoes. It's important that I invest that money back into my business so that I can increase my business value um, and just keep the business flourishing. Now, when we look at the expense of a home or being out and owning a car and things of that nature, it is important that 
you prioritize your spending so that you can have fun, but you're also advancing yourself. And lastly, um, I think it's important that as you increase your value, as you increase your, uh, your money, it's important that you adjust your budget because your money is going to change. Life is gonna happen sometimes. You may uh, misjudge or misinterpret how much something is gonna cost. So it's important that your budget is realistic and you're constantly adjusting your budget to fit your needs. And some tips I would leave you with, um, avoid bulk discount stores, eat at home. I know a lot of times when we're working or you know we're running between classes, we like to grab something to eat and that could hurt your pockets. So definitely uh, start trying to cook and making your own lunch. Um, I would definitely advise making credit the exception rule, not, or making credit the exception, not the rule. A lot of the times I know for myself, at first I used uh, my credit card as cash and it's not cash because you have to pay that money back. So just use that. I would advise to use it as leverage and uh, budgeting apps, uh, spreadsheets. Those are definitely ways that you can organize yourself. And it's easy to spend more each month when using apps and not keeping track of your actual spending. So just be aware of what you're doing. Okay. Um, now Alex is going to go through these slides on um, managing risk. Thank you, uh, Zaire. That was really good. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Chetion. I'm a senior at Georgia State University. I'm majoring in finance with a concentration of fintech, and I'll uh, be talking to you guys about managing your risks. So managing and mitigating risks is crucial to becoming financially independent, as well as securing a strong financial growth in your life. Uh, and some steps you can take to kind of manage and mitigate these risks are to do some research, understand what type of risks can arise in life, and understanding what steps you can take to kind of negate when these risks do come up. So this is going to kind of lead me into the first part of my presentation, which is avoiding fraud. So why should you be a... Okay. So, yeah, very quickly, uh, why should you be concerned about fraud? Uh, online fraud is rising, and so the size of the damage. Uh, this is mainly due to fraud going from physical to digital. So it's a kind of a change in the landscape, which is quite interesting, but can also be very dangerous to your wallets and to your accounts. And if a thief steals your identity and begins, begins racking up debt, it could take months or years to reverse the damage, and it's better to protect yourself from it happening in the first place. Uh, there's an elderly man in Smyrna County. I don't know if you guys know where that is. But uh, he fell for a phishing scam, which is when a scammer sends a very identical or similar email to, uh, to someone and they accidentally click a link or they sign in to a fake account and the scammer is able to get the, their information. Uh, when he did this, the scammer was actually able to log into his bank account, liquidate all of his retirement funds and take out a loan with that money. But I mean, in about a month after he was able to, you know, get all his money back after he talked to the banks and everything. But the hassle that he went through and not knowing whether you're going to get your hard-earned money back is, you know, no one wants to go through that. So it's very important to take precautions and to understand what you can do to prepare yourself better and to avoid these types of frauds. And you expose yourself to fraud every time you, you know, put in your social security network, you log into your bank account on an unverified source, et cetera. And another example of uh, fraudulent or data breaches happening is uh, with the Equifax. So over 143 million American consumers, sensitive personal information was exposed in a data breach. Uh, this happened in one of the three major credit reporting agencies. So what can you do to avoid your information getting out even when you're not in control of it? Uh, you can get free copies of your credit report. You can consider placing security freezes or locks on your credit report and also fraudulent alerts on your credit report. So now I'm gonna be talking about an emergency fund. So what is an emergency fund? It's money set aside for use in the event of a personal financial dilemma, such as job loss, a car repair, a medical emergency, which is the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States, home repairs, and again, fraud. And so currently 45% of the population doesn't have $400 for an emergency and 60% doesn't have $1,000. 
So this shows just how, how like how low people, people's income are, not even that their income are low, but that they're not budgeting correctly, like Sayur said, that they're not putting money aside because you don't know when things are gonna happen and you have to be pre prepared for when these things do arise. So why do you need an emergency fund? Because it provides flexibility in a job search so you don't have to take the first opportunity that arises and it can have a huge impact on your future earnings power and future financial. And it provides contentment and peace of mind, which de decreases stress levels. And for me personally, in the, towards the end of October, we had a house fire. And for the first probably four to five days, we were negotiating and talking to our insurance company. And we had to pay out of pocket for our food, our, you know, the hotel, et cetera. So without an emergency fund in place, we may not have had a roof over our heads. And it, you know, you don't expect for you to have house fire that something like that would ever happen to yourself. But it, you know, this is life and stuff happens unexpectedly. So it's very important to have an emergency fund in place to make sure that you're not at risk or you're not exposed to uh, you know, a random occurrence or random event happening. So kind of overall with the emergency fund, it's far better to be prepared than to be unprepared when these events happen. And any money that you set aside and budget for this emergency fund is better than none. So, and it's important to start as early as possible because the earlier you start, the more it's gonna accumulate over time. So now I'm gonna be talking about credit score, which is FICO score. And FICO does predictive analytics for three rating agencies, which are TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. And their scores range from 300 to 850, with higher being better. And all aspects of financial well-being work together to credit important, why would it matter to me? Well, with a high credit score in your lifetime, you will save around $100,000 just from having a higher credit than the average person. Next. So credit score. Uh, you wanna go this one? Yeah, you can go back one, thank you. Um, so credit score is broken down, kind of like a class, or I don't know what universities you guys attend, but it's broken down with 35% of the uh, FICO or credit score being composed of payment history, 30% being amount of debt, 15% being the length of history, 10% being new credit and 10% being credit mix. So obviously some components are more valuable to really focus on, but together they all you know, compose your total FICO score, credit score. And it's very important to make sure that you're on top of uh, all the different factors that play into your FICO score. So overall, your credit and debt should be utilized carefully. Uh, these are good channels to take, you know, to being able to get a loan or being able to use your credit card. They're very good avenues and can help you out, but they can also be dangerous. So you have to know what you're doing and you have to have a strong foundation uh, to really help support you and not kind of fall behind. Because if you fall behind in a credit card payment, uh, their interest rates are pretty high. I think they range from about 14 to 17% per month. So, you know, once you fall behind, it's very easy to just get behind that ball and just not be able to catch up. And you want to put yourself in a good position to succeed, which you can do that by managing your FICO score and all, as well as automating payments below some level, whether that's $50, $100, $150 to simplify your life and strengthen your scores and secure your financial future. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm going to pass it on to Lynn. He's going to talk to you about investing in yourself. Thank you, Alex. Um, I want to quickly give a shout out to everyone who's with us today. I am Lynn Chi, and I'm a student at Georgia State, and I will be a finance graduate, hopefully, this May. All right, so let's get started. Most of us are at the age where building human personal human capital is our main priority. Your human capital is the intangible assets or qualities that you possess, such as your skills, your education, intelligence, health, work experience, etc. And as we age, our human capital builds our financial assets, which are liquid and tangible, such as cash, bank deposits, stocks, bonds, etc. But how do we build our financial assets to match our human capital value? Next, please. Oops, sorry. Uh, 
So I moved out of college at 18 and in order to not live at home and have my nagging Chinese mother breathing down my neck 24 seven, um, I had to pay for everything besides my tuition on my own. So that meant rent, bills, insurance, food, and a bunch of things that I've never had to pay for on my own. I was working at least four days a week as a server and bartender while being a full-time student. For the next two years, I was constantly playing catch up with myself. I make enough to cover my needs, but I'd always had to work extra shifts to cover the things I wanted. Extra shift meant less time for school, less time for social events, and ultimately it just made having fun less and less appealing. I was so obsessed with making money that most of my efforts ended up compromising my education, my health, and contentment. So the time that I spent on school was just enough to keep my scholarship. Internships and thinking about the future after graduation was just non-existent. I figured as long as I get a degree, I can get a real big girl job and everything will be perfect and great. I was kind of right, but mostly wrong. <laughs> Next, please. So this is a chart that shows the difference in average yearly earnings among full-time workers with and without a college degree. As you can see, the ones with bachelor degrees clearly outperforms the other two. However, these are based off of averages, not guarantees. Every single one of us is different, and that means college isn't for everyone. It's up to you as an individual to decide your best method of learning. So I'm sure you guys have all heard this before. Education is extremely necessary for success. But a good education isn't about the school you go to or the grades that you get. I wish it was that black and white. It's really about the quality of knowledge that you attain in your personal life from the moment you're born till the day you die. And there are countless ways to increase one's level of education and skills. Personally, I like to take at least an hour a day to educate myself on things I find interesting. Because when I'm passionate about the things that I'm learning, I begin to associate that same passion with learning. And learning is a skill. And like any skill, it must be practiced. Whether you're learning candle making or learning how to trade stocks, you're improving your ability to learn. And I think a lot of people associate learning with pressurized memorization, cramming, especially those of us who are still in school. Um, my mom used to tell me, if you don't like learning, then learn to love it. A love for learning will change your entire perception of obtaining knowledge in the real world. And speaking of learning, the biggest thing I learned this year is that nothing is more important than your personal health. So I had COVID and strep at the same time back in April. I could have saved myself a lot of pain had I just rested early and listened to my body. I'm lucky that I've always been relatively healthy, but even so, like everyone else, my body has its limits. Um, improving and maintaining personal health is a continuous working progress. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but our body's ability to fight usually declines with age. A cold for me might last about three days with mild symptoms, but for my mom, it will last over a week with a lot more serious symptoms, even though she's a very healthy individual. Next, please. All right, so an individual who is healthy physically and mentally will most likely have better finances than one who's sick all the time. Healthcare events are actually the leading cause of personal bankruptcies. It's a lot cheaper and a lot more painless to improve and maintain your health early on. All right, exercise. It's the easiest thing you can do, but also the hardest thing to get us going. <laughs> it gives really good benefits and it doesn't require a lot of time or energy. 15 to 30 minutes out of a 12 hour day. That's all it takes. 
Um, now let's look at how full your wallet could be if you improved certain health behaviors. All right, so I know we all have our vices and our urges, and I believe that everything in moderation is great. But a lot of the times we don't notice how bad our habits are until we are way too deep. Um, next slide, please. So personally, I like to write down everything that I spend for the week. Um, and look, I'm generally not happy about my spending habits when I look at the numbers at the end of the week because I'm not perfect. I can't resist every urge, but at least I know what I need to work on so that um, next week's spending habits can be a little better. And the, oh, yeah, it's fine. Um, I was just gonna say the better your habits are, the better you perform in your overall life. Um, there are many ways to protect good health and sometimes it's overwhelming looking at everything that you want to improve on. So it's easier to start small and one thing at a time. If you're horrible about eating healthy, start with one fruit or vegetable a day. Add it to your daily routine and after a small while, that will become a part of your daily routine. Health is something you build on. It can't change overnight. And it's the same thing with contentment. So I want everyone to pause and just think about the things that make you happy. How many of those things can be bought? How many of those things must be earned? How many of those are intangible? Knowing what makes you happy is extremely important and it reflects how well you know yourself. It also reflects your financial well being. Learning to spend less requires being content with yourself. I'm going to repeat that again. Learning to spend less requires being content with what you have or with yourself. And if you're not content with what you have, then maybe it's time to think about how you delegate your time. Next, please. So here are some key drivers of contentment. As you can see, everything on this list is intangible. I'm not saying a brand new Porsche won't make me happy, but that happiness is timed. In a couple years, I'm going to be itching for the new model because I place my happiness on something that depreciates over time. Spending time with the ones I love, however, only grows my love for them and makes me appreciate them more over time. So by investing your time and energy in things that will grow in value over time, you are investing in yourself and in your happiness. So research shows that happiness leads to a wide range of benefits. I was taught at a young age that success is the key to happiness but I've also learned that happiness can be the key to success. And when we are happy, we are actually healthier, more productive and nicer in general. We are better able to focus on the brighter side of the situation. Of course, we all encounter adversity and it's in our nature to feel negative emotions, but happiness is being able to make the most of the good times but also to cope with the inevitable bad times. Let's look at a few suggestions for building contentment, especially for when you're down. Um, personally, I find deep breathing to be extremely helpful when I'm stressed. I'll take a couple minutes to close my eyes and just focus on breathing. Science shows that deep breathing actually releases more oxygen in your body um, and ups our endorphins. So I, always feel more clear-headed after a few short minutes, but everyone is different. What works for me may not work for you. However, we're all capable of being happy. Um, happiness is a choice. It's not something you're born with. It's not something that just comes to you. It's up to you to make yourself happy. Find a way to be content with what you have. Plan for what you want in the future. Set incentives and rewards for along the way. Invest in yourself in the best way for you. 
And that sums up my portion, and I'm going to hand it over to Stephen, who will finish up our presentation with investing for you. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that. I think these three students have done a great job. Um, we'll, we'll hold the applause till the end. Um, I think that what I'd like to talk about is um, compounding. When we think about the magic of investing, it really is about the concept of leaving your money and letting it work for you. Having interest on interest on interest. When you keep leaving money, these orange bars show, you grow that money and then the interest goes on top and then that gives you more money to keep growing. And so the principal produces the interest and then it gets added on top. And so you've got to leave it alone though. That's the key to compounding. You've got to walk away and say, I'm going to work on the things I can work on. My investments or the companies that I buy are going to work on doing their business and I'm let them do that. And by doing that, we, we, we are allowing ourselves the room to succeed in this area. And so you've got to give yourself some time. Success doesn't come overnight and you need to let time work in your favor. You're young and that's one of the keys is, as uh, Alex mentioned, age and, and being able to, you know, and Zaire talked about, you know, retirement, starting early and getting to work on it really makes a big difference. Um, so let dividends and interest reinvest fees eat into your results. If the average return for a manager is seven and a half percent, um, 75 basis points or 1% is quite a drag on your performance. It's going to be about one to 10 to 13%. And that's just going to the fees that you don't necessarily need. And I think that it's important for you to realize don't let fees eat into your results. You work hard for your money. You want your money to work hard for you. So taxes matter. So put less efficient tax assets in non-taxable accounts. Start early and increase automatically as you grow. As your salary goes up in this first job and you get a two or 3% raise, put another 1% on to your 401k. You won't notice, you'll still have extra money and you'll start to feel better about the amount that's growing outside in your 401k. So when I think about um, investing, you need to think about the time frame of what you're investing for. Are you investing for an emergency fund or to go on a vacation in the next two years? Then that's not money that you put at risk and put into the market. That's something you leave in cash. That's something that's short term in zero to three years. The intermediate term, buying a car, buying a house, those things you would put at some of it at risk, but not all of it. And that way, if there is a downturn in the market, you don't have to lose your plans. You can still recover. Um, what you don't want is to leave it all in cash and then have none of it growing as you're growing. Because then the long term, paying for kids' college, retiring, um, some of the longer term goals you have those are assets that you can take more risk with. So here's an example of what I mean by taking risk or not taking risk. When you look at the short term needs, three to six months, or I think we said up to three years on the prior slide, emergencies, put it all in cash. That can be short term investing um, cash or cash equivalents. When you think about the medium term, five to 10 years, college, home, Putting 50, 30 to 50% in stocks and the remainder in bonds gives you some inflation protection and allows you their assets to grow. And that'll help you in that medium term reach that goal. So it's not all your savings that gets you there. It's also some help from Mr. Market. And then the long-term goals, you want to be somewhere in that 60 to 80% range of stocks to bonds. Those long-term assets, you want to give as great a chance as you can to work through the market and take advantage of time. Time is your friend. Being patient, as Lynn mentioned, is a big part of how you achieve success because it's happiness is what you make it. So now when you look at a more detailed graph, these are all the different things and how they look in terms of immediacy on the one axis down below on the x-axis, 
and on the y-axis is the importance. And you see rainy day account is very important and it's also very immediately needed. So when we look at all of these things, they all have different places in your life and you need to try to think and plan for them and plan for the life you want. As Zahir said, it's really up to you to make the choice and the plan. And it's not about constricting yourself. It's about putting your priorities first. What are your priorities with your money? Then you take those priorities and you apply it to your investments. I want to start something small in a business. I put that in cash and when I get enough cash, I'll start it. When I want to do something for retirement, I put this money away and I, I buy an index fund and I, I put it mostly in equities. That, you know, aligning yourself and your money and your plans with what you want. Goals are based on you. There's no one like you and your goals are, should be tied to who you are and what you want to achieve. Don't look at the television. Don't look at social media. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, what makes me happy and what do I want to do with my money? So then you take these and you move them along what they call the risk and return frontier. And so you see the lower risk, we got the rainy day fund and the higher risk, you've got charitable contributions and pensions. I think that what you're trying to do here is say, I want to put things and I want to achieve things. So I put more risk into those things where I have a longer time horizon and I can wait and I have things that I need right away, like a rainy day account or an emergency fund. Rome wasn't built in a day. And I think the graph that um, Lynn showed at the beginning with your human capital, I think one of the saddest things is that students feel like, oh, I'm so poor now. I'm so poor, I don't have anything. You have all of your human capital ahead of you. 45 years to work in the markets and work in, in jobs and take your human capital and apply it and get paid. Doing that for 40 or 45 years, you're gonna have a lot of opportunities to improve yourself and improve your, your life. Therefore, don't look at yourself as I, I have no money, therefore I'm no success. That's the exact opposite. You have all the potential. You have all of those assets that you're gonna apply in ways that are gonna make a difference in your life. And so, look at it as implementing a plan with a whole bunch of capital and you apply your capital, which is your time and your energy in ways and in places that matter to you. If the, you enjoy doing technical analysis and looking at you know matrices and multiplying and, and looking at different biofactors that, that influence diseases, that's what you do. You put yourself in a position where you're utilizing and you're using your, your skills the way you want to make a difference in whatever you think is important. And that's the same thing with your money. When you think about this, we like to break down assets into two types. There's defensive assets and growth assets. Most people would say there's stocks and there's bonds, but that's a little bit getting more into the minutia. What we think about when we think about money is you need to have a certain amount of growth and you need to have some assets that are safe so that those safe assets are there. If there is a downturn, if there is an emergency, you have those assets and you can take them out and that's what they're there for. Growth assets are things that you're not gonna need for a while and they need to beat inflation. And so they tend to be stocks, but I think that real estate and property and other things are also important. So thinking about things just as defensive and growth, I think is a much simpler way to look at it. And I think it's easier for people to not get overwhelmed. I don't think looking at Snowflake or looking at CNBC is definitely not where you wanna get your advice on how to do things with your money. You've got to personalize it and try to do your own research and try to understand some of the basic ideas yourself. Don't let the media tell you, I have to buy this IPO. I have to own this. It's good. I've got to have this social media company. It may not fit with what your desires are and what your plans are. There's a difference between investing and trading. Investing is somebody who's buying something for a while. 
they plan on holding and watching the company evolve. Trading is something that you do for a short period of time. Short-term trading does not equal long-term success. If you want to succeed in investing, you need to take a longer time horizon. Long-term results usually come to those who are patient. Now I look at some different assets and you think about a 25 year returns for the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, IFO, which is a, a large developed international or emerging markets. And then we look at corporate bonds, aggregate bonds and cash. And these returns are through 2019. So investors hurt themselves with too much cash. Women tend to be more conservative. And there's a, been a recent study that shows that women returns are one to one and a half percent below the average of men because they tend to have more cash. They tend to be more conservative and they tend to be worried about um, short-term losses. So therefore it hurts them in terms of their returns. I think you need to think about your assets and know that if you've got safety assets, your other assets, you should be investing for growth. The bias is to trade at the wrong time. Have the courage when others are fearful. When others are worried about the market, like last March and April, that was the time to take some cash and put it to work. You need to be disciplined. And when people are fearful, that's when you should be greedy. Plan to check on a disciplined schedule. You, you shouldn't be looking at your account every day. Look at things on a quarterly or a six month basis and then make adjustments. The watch pot never boils. And the best analogy I have for nature is the tree grows slowly, but over time you can see the difference as a tree grows. Um, this looks at retirement and this talks about the idea of if you invest starting at 25, 35, or 45, how would your results have been different? And I think that when you think about this, it really shows you how putting $10,000 a year into this, you know, yes, I'm going to have 10 years um, of, of doing that. But overall, when you think about the difference in money from that 10 year period, that's $100,000. Look at the difference between 25 and 35. It's a million dollars. A million dollars difference if you can commit early. That's who, there's been three or four points of today's presentation that I think everybody should take with them. A million dollars more if you start 10 years earlier. $400,000, the benefit of a college education. And $100,000 if your credit score is better than average. Those three ideas added together is a million and a half dollars. I think all of the other things we talk about with coffee and not going to Starbucks, it's the big things that matter. And so follow some of those big ideas and the little ideas will start to take care of themselves. This looks at, and, and everybody who sends us an email will, will, will email the presentation to you. So I think we'll try to get a hold of them and maybe we'll put a link out um, on the websites for people. But there's a lot of text here, but really what it talks about is the differences in your different uh, decades of life. When you're in your 20s, you want to have fun, you want to travel, you just got out of college, you're, you're, you're eager to learn and to do different things. Your 30s, you're thinking about owning a home. Your 40s, you're starting to think about your kid's college. Your 50s, you're starting to make good money and you're starting to think I can spend that money. How do you handle yourself in those different decades Understand that you're in a life cycle. You're in one stage of your life. Each stage has its challenges and your plans will change, but always keep your head when others are losing theirs and your perspective will get you through these things. In summary, uh, I think I just wanna say, start early and let compounding work for you. Develop and follow your plan. This isn't what's for good for Lynn is not necessarily what Alex wants or what Zaire wants. They each have their own plans and their own ideas. You have your own plan. Craft your own plan with your budget and then look at your investments as a way for you to implement and satisfy your plan. It's your 
responsibility to take care of your credit score. It's your results that you're going to have in the market. It, you're the one who's going to benefit from better health and better mental well-being. You're going to earn more money in your job. You're going to see better results. So think about your plan and how it all fits together. Um, diversify between defensive and growth assets. Don't put it all in one place. Don't keep switching in and out. Just try to be consistent. Invest systematically and automatically. Payroll deduction is the greatest thing you can do. If you don't see the money, you only see the money that's left at the end of the month. You see money going in every year, cost averaging into the market. It's wonderful to get a match from your company. Free money is always a good thing. I always encourage people take free money whenever you can. Um, it's like declining a raise if you don't take it. Think long-term versus short-term. This is a marathon and not a sprint. So when you train, you, you realize I need to be ready for all 26 miles. I don't want to be really good in the first six months of, of having a job and then start to encounter problems later. You're going to make decisions in the next six months when you start a job. You're going to go into an HR meeting and they're going to say, how much do you want to put in your 401k? How much, you know, you're going to make decisions about what to, to do an apartment on your own or with a roommate. You're going to make decisions about buying a car, leasing a car, or taking public transportation. All those decisions should be part of your plan. And you should think about how to do those things so that they satisfy your objectives. Um, I think now we're, we're good to take some questions. Um, does anybody have questions? Let's see, I got one chat here comment. Good information. All right. Um, Hello, Steve. Can, can you hello. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, Steve. So this is um, Arindam. Uh, I run Sensei, which is a financial education solution. Uh, my question for the group, uh, especially for the presenters who presented today, do you believe that the financial institutions that you bank with or associate yourselves with, are they doing a good job in providing the right kind of financial education to its customers? especially for people who are millennials, who are Generation Z on the threshold of getting into the workplace or are just entered the work workplace. I mean, the facts are that very few states still are able to make financial education compulsory. But don't, do you think that the financial institutions are living up to the responsibility? Um, well, each of them are just, I don't even know if they've started their jobs yet. So it might be hard for them to answer, but I, I will tell you, I think that, you know, we are as a country making a big mistake by not making it part of our national education. I think we should, we, we educate people about how to do laundry and how to do, you know, we understand the, the risks of, of drugs and alcohol, but we don't understand the risks of too much debt. Um, so I think we as a country need to focus more of our energy on educating people. And that's why these three guys um, all decided to do this. They said it's something I think other students could benefit from. So I think it's, um, it's up to them to, to answer. But I would say, yes, we, we all need to do more. And I think as leaders in an industry, the CFAs in Atlanta are trying to do more by doing this, these type of events and getting students more engaged in the topic. And I hope it leads to a better you know, outcome and more, more people who can succeed. Do you guys have any comments? Um, I guess just to answer your question, like I've, I have, I've banked with one of the major banks and, you know, honestly, I don't feel like they give back too much without any like tips or education, like kind of, pointers that they could give, especially like with the mobile app, I feel like it'd be pretty easy to, you know, build something out for people that just began or even, you know, experienced users just to, I don't know, have some articles or something, but at least in my experience, I haven't, I haven't really like encountered any financial education that was being pushed by my banking institution or honestly any major institution, at least from that I've seen. So. Got it. Um, for me, 
I definitely would agree with what uh, Steven said. And I think that institutions, as far as college, uh, lack the update of finances. They'll, it's easy to teach a curriculum, but when you have markets growing every day and you know things are transitioning, you know technology is advancing, we're not taught how to keep up with that. It's kind of just like a curriculum. Got it. I also have a, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but just one curious question for Lynn. Uh, you, in your presentation, uh, very pleasantly, you straddled the need for learning about healthcare and you combined that with financial literacy. Very few people actually uh, see them in the same bucket, uh, financial uh, health, and financial literacy as part of the whole financial wellness ecosystem. Is that, I'm just curious whether people who are your peers because of COVID, are they increasingly seeing knowledge about health as part of the financial wellness, financial literacy uh, domain, so to speak? It, 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 was, it was a breath of fresh air to, to listen to your presentation, if I may. Oh, thank you. Um, I think that health is really important. And I think a lot of the times when we think about money, that's kind of in its own little bubble, mm -hmm. right? So we think that everything going on in our lives is separate from this tangible thing. But when you think about it, everything correlates together. And I think because of COVID, I've come to a realization that you know, health is extremely important because I went through COVID and I realized how disabling it can be. And so when, when you're not focused on your health and when you have bad health, it only gets worse. And the worse that it gets, the more money you have to spend. And so I guess that's what I was trying to tie into. Got it. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen a lot of studies that talk about the, the fact that financial financially people don't have enough uh, they're fragile with only four hundred dollars of savings and so for us I think it it really highlights the fact that that emergency fund you know first of all I would love to not have an emergency that would be wonderful if I could wave my wand but I don't think that's reasonable you know I mean people are going to get into fender benders people are going to have my daughter called me as I was getting ready for this you know yesterday and she said uh, my battery just went and I'm stuck at a, you know a, a supermarket and I don't want people to you know I don't want people to interact with me what do I do and you know she has AAA and I, I just think you you have to kind of do some fragility estimating of your own right and say hey what happens if and just do a little bit of that and then all of a sudden that hundred five hundred a thousand dollars that you put away like that it really makes you sleep a lot better because you realize, hey, if something happens, I know that I've got this taken care of and I can have a credit card backup and I can have further you know, reserves or other things. But I think that what we noticed was that the people love to design financial success as assets. I, I don't know how many college students I've said that I've met that say, I wanna have a million dollars. Okay, you know what I mean? If a million dollars, that's my goal. I want a million by 30. Some, you know, and, I, and I've always been like, you know, you're worth much more than a million dollars. If you take the discounted value that human capital graph showed, the discounted value of your future earnings, when you start out at 50, 60, 70,000, it's going to be a large number, right? Just do the math. 45 times, if you start at 60, you're going to average probably 90 that that's a that's a large number and so therefore you kind of have to say think about things long term calm and balance and that will lead you to i want to have more energy when i get up in the morning i'm not going to eat stuff that when i get to, to work at 10 o'clock i'm going to feel exhausted and not not have any protein right i want i want to have the energy that gets me through the day so that i succeed at my job and then guess what happens? Because you're not angry, you're not 
you're not, you're not tense, you're more relaxed and you have less stress, you perform better. And what do you think companies like to pay people? People who are stressed or people who perform better? And so all of a sudden it works in that virtuous way. And that's what I think has been missing from some of the discussion about, and I know we were a little bit five years ago when we brought up the concept of meditation or prayer, it was a debate on the board as to how do we handle this? How do we talk about prayer and finance? Is that something that's appropriate? And ultimately we believed it was. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Are there any other questions? I, don't see I have a question. Okay. Hi. Um, I had muted and, and stopped my video. Hi, everybody. So nice to meet you all. Um, I was curious about the impact of influencers in social media. Aren't they constantly just promoting, you know, the way that they get paid is by promoting the purchase of products and services in some way, shape, or form. Is that because I have a tendency not to pay attention to influencers. I'm not the right age bracket. I don't know how, how uh, I'm just kind of res responding to how the media seems to be talking about influencers. How do, how, do you, how do you see the need for financial constraint against the maybe the influen influencers and, and their promotion of different um, activities and it might be counter to those uh, objectives. Am I, are those influencers really having as much impact do you think in the world as, as the um, news media would indicate? Um, I, oh. Go ahead. Okay. So I, um, what I would say to that is I would say it depends on the individual that use social media because all social media is free which means that the users of social media are the product. So we're, we're the ones that are being sold. And so when you have all these influencers coming in, selling, I don't know, the, the newest face mask or whatever, you know, that that's, that's what we're all on there for. Because essentially, I'm not sure if you've seen um, the Netflix special Social Dilemma, but it talks about how all the I'm writing that down. Yeah, social dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's super cool because it talks about how social media was created to be a platform where the users are the products. We're the mm -hmm. ones being sold because all we see every single day is ads, ads, ads. And so I think influencers can only influence the people that use social media on a daily basis, um, which I think goes into a whole nother thing of monitoring social media and cutting down all that but that's that's my commentary on that <laughs> um in response to what uh lynn just said i definitely do agree but i would also state that i'm starting to see a trend of people um filtering their social media because they see how it can have a negative impact on their outlook of things and also their finances you know, a lot of the time social media is uh, fed uh, to us as a lifestyle. And what we don't know is that they're getting paid for that lifestyle. They're getting paid for these, you know, face products and things like that. It's not them just going and buying their money. But again, like Lynn said, we're the, the, uh, the consumers of everything. So it definitely does uh, hurt us when we're not focused on the right things and we don't filter things like that out. Alex, do you have any comments? Um, I mean, I definitely agree with what Lennon Zaire said. And I would just say in general, I think they're like the main point of influencers is to try to project a lifestyle that they don't actually live. So a lot of it is just a facade. So whether the media is overreacting to whether, you know, an influencer really does have this much like influence over other people. I think it, I, it's kind of hard to judge. I definitely think there is some influence because, you know, especially kids nowadays, they definitely, they're very dependent on social media. That's what they look at most of the day. 
and they kind of build up their role models and look up to these people that may or may not actually do what they say or live the life that they project. So. And the only thing I'd say, Kathy, is that I, I've seen a lot of trends about healthcare that people are now spending more time outdoors and people are more are, are exercising more and doing more around their homes. And uh, I think those are habits that are wonderful for people to, you know, to not have to commute. You think about what that means for so many people who would sit on their phone on the train or on their phone, you know, glued to whatever they were, you know, when you have that free time of adding an hour, an hour and a half to your day by no commute. I mean, I think those people who have replaced it with good habits are going to come out of this stronger. And I think they're going to be stronger and better consumers in the end, because I think that people have taken their heads up and looked outside and realized that there are benefits to that 30 minute walk and doing some exercise and, and try and eat a little bit better. So I, I'm, I'm kind of positive of what comes out of COVID because of this, because I think that, that a lot of people and young people or a lot of the people I talk to who say that, yeah, they're doing a lot more things that are good for them and a lot less things that are bad. So <laughs> I'm hopeful. Hey, Andrew, do you have a question? I have a quick question, but first of all, I'd like to, uh, commend Zaire, Alex, and Lynn um, for their presentations. Um, gives me hope for the future. Great job, guys. And, and I've got a question, a real simple one. Uh, I also uh, work with uh, Sensei in financial education. For the financial institutions, what's the one thing you would say that they can do better at reaching out to you with information that's useful? Um, so I will go first, if that's okay with you guys. So I think, I think the information is there. I think the information is there regardless of what institution you're talking about. But I think the problem is finding that information because a lot of the times it's, dis it's dispersed in many different areas. So I think um, it's overwhelming because you think that you are you have to learn a lot more than you need to because they don't make it easy, I guess, for you to learn because that's mm -hmm. not what they're pushing. They're not pushing for our knowledge, you know? They're, they're pushing for business. And it's, that's, that's just, I guess, how it works. But I think, um, I think the information is there. I think it's up to the individual to have to shuffle through a lot of things in order to find what they're looking for. Um, personally, I studied business, so learning this information was a lot easier for me because I was taught this in school. So when I signed up with banks and E-Trade and all this stuff, I kind of already had an idea of what everything means. But, you know, for someone who's taking English for their major, they, they're not even going to know where to start. So that's my input thank, on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I agree with what Lynn said. Uh, definitely the information, uh, to me, the fundamentals are there in school. But I think um, if schools were able to push self-education, uh, you know, taking the fundamentals and then teaching us how to seek information to advance ourselves, um, as well as image consulting, not looking at just what you wear or your haircut, but more so um, how to become more marketable, how to become more valuable, build your resources, you know, presentations like this, learning how to live with less, uh, manage your risk and things like that. I feel like this type of presentation, this type of information is what schools need to provide for students like myself, Lynn and Alex. Yeah, and then to uh, just add on top of that, I think two of the most important things that institutions can do to kind of promote and push this information is the delivery, how they deliver the information, which I think using, you know, technology, social media, whatever digital platform that may be is crucial because I think, I mean, it's only going to grow the amount of people using the internet, using these platforms and also incentivizing the users, which 
I think LinkedIn does a pretty good job with that. They have quizzes and other things that you can get certificates in, or at least get an approval in that. And you can show to everyone that you connect with, hey, I just took this quiz, I'm verified. So I think that's, those two can be, at least in my opinion, are pretty pivotal in trying to incentivize younger people or people that maybe don't really have the focus or the motivation to do it on their own. And yeah, I think, I don't know, it's just, it's difficult to incentivize people when there's so much going on, when they have so much access to other information or to all these different avenues that they can take, so. And um, I'm just gonna throw something out completely random, but it just happened. I just got, I'm sure, a phishing text message, a fake Wells Fargo alert about a declined debit card. And I can tell right now that this is not from somebody who knows what the heck is doing because the dollar sign is at the end. It says number, number, dollar sign. Now we know that Americans put the dollar sign before the number, but I know this is not real. But my first instinct was to call my husband. Did you try to use your credit card? Did you try to use your debit card? It's crazy. I mean, it just is sick. But I just wanted to let you know that this is the season. I got you on the line. It just happened. Be alert. Don't, don't lose your focus. And make sure your phone is, is not going to be your enemy going forward. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I think you guys need a round of applause because I think you've done a great job. And I, I really appreciate your effort as to being leaders here. And um, I, I appreciate everybody who's on the line. And, and this video will be going up on um, the ASFIP Foundation site and also probably the Decatur site. So if you have people or friends who you think it was valuable, please share it. Please uh, let other people know so that uh, more people will have a good holiday and a great 2021. Yes, absolutely. And um, also Rich Fendler had a question on the chat. Okay. Should, we, should we read it? Sure. Really what was the question? Uh, to the student presenters, do you guys think financial literacy should be taught in middle school, high school, or college? Okay. I mean, I, I think it's part of in general, social science. So I, I believe that when you start talking about economics, you should start about personal. So I would say it really isn't relevant until you can make money to understand how to spend money. Um, so I kind of think it should start somewhere in the late middle school, uh, early high school. Um, and that's because I think when you start to talk to people about retirement and they're, you know, I've, I've had students in the fourth and fifth grade that I've talked to and it's just, it's just hard for them to relate. So I think that um, when they start to get the math skills, I think it's important um, that they start to understand compounding and, and how that works. Um, yeah, um, I, I definitely agree with what Steven said. I think, you know, starting from middle school and it should kind of just be phases. as you build your way up, you build the foundation of financial literacy, the, the older that you get. So then when you do graduate high school or you do graduate college, at least you can, you know, land with both feet on your ground, you know what you're doing and you can go from there, so. All right, thank you folks. We're gonna cut, uh, cut it there and uh, please have a great holiday season and a great 2021. I appreciate all you. I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you. Great job guys, great job. Thank you. How do you think that went guys? Um, I think it went very well, actually. I like yeah, that um, they were we very interactive with us. It wasn't yeah. kind of just like we were talking to ourselves. So, oh, I thought it was uh, kind of interesting to have that. I, th I originally thought the sensei guy was a little bit, I was a little bit worried, you know, but as he started to talk and I thought it was interesting, you know what I mean? They're, they're just trying to figure out from, you know, you guys are important. There's a lot of, uh, money in the, and and you guys are going to make a lot of decisions and how the industry treats you is, is important so i think you got to think of yourselves as the future consumers for many years and think about how you do that well you get in good habits now i think it will really help you and so kathy i know you're still there so i uh, want i know you probably have some comments
How did you, did you get a recording ROK, Digus? Yeah, so I'm still recording, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off now. Okay. Um, how did you think it went, 